Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Hear Our Voices. This is your host, Kay Did. Thank you for joining us today on the podcast. Please, guys, give me some reminders. So can you please follow us on social media? Everything will be linked down below on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok. We are everywhere. So if you want to find us on any platform, you can also follow us on all of them. You can follow us on one of them. But I'll tell you, we have almost daily updates about job postings and um, things like that on our Instagram page. Twitter, we're, we're going along, but Instagram, I say, is uh, a lot of updates on there. And thank you for just coming back and listening to the podcast. Thank you for being a part of our community. Please, guys, also join the community on here. Whatever platform you're listening on, just join, you know, a little join tab. And if you have any questions or concerns or things like that, you could definitely DM us anytime. We would love to hear what you have to say. If you have a topic you think we should talk about, definitely tell us about that because we're always looking for new ideas and we love to know what people want to listen to because you know on our ideas like this might not be enough it could be something that you think about or something we didn't think about yet and if you'd like to be on the podcast guys we would love to have you so definitely check us out and send put us a dm, DM. so you know yeah anyway so today's guest we have is marisol she's a person she'll tell you more about the um the nonprofit that she works for and what they do. But before she gets into it, I want to say anybody who has been listening to this podcast know that we tell stories and things like that. And we also give resources of what people can use in this community. We try to give some prevention, but sometimes we don't get to you in time for prevention. We get to you when you're in shelter or when you're out of shelter, what's next, right? And in the past couple of years, especially in New York City and around, I would say around the country, I could say, we want to find a way to actually change how we see homelessness, the way we talk about homelessness and things like that. Um, it's all about the narrative. People have a narrative of how homelessness actually looks. And the narrative people put out there in pictures and on, new, on the news is actually not the way it is. Um, you see me how I am now. And, you know, I look the same way I did when I was in, in, in the shelter. People don't think about that, like how a person actually looks when they're in shelter or, you know, tucked away, as I say, um, people think about the person on the street. People think of a drug addict. People think has this face of what they think a person who's homeless should look like. And a lot of times they don't think about families. They don't think about youths. They don't think about a person going through trafficking and have to go into a shelter because they went through a hard time, you know. So this a podcast is here to kind of help you narrow in on what homelessness is really about and the faces of homelessness and the solutions of homelessness. That's the thing we try to really do drive home this year is giving solutions because we could talk about problems all day. It, it, you can talk about any problem, anything you think about in the world, global warming, this and that. But the thing about it, if you're giving out all these problems, but no solution, how can we go forward? So that's our thing that we want to make sure we give this year and really drive home. And hopefully you can join in on the things that we're on because we right now sharing a lot of policy stuff and things like that. I want to make sure that you know all the facts about the situation. Granted, it's a 30 minute podcast, so you don't need to know but so much facts, but we wanna make sure that you get the information so you can also make an informed decision and also help out the fight. You might not be at every rally. You might not be on every Twitter post, but at least you know the information and you'll be able to help out in your particular community to push on um, the things that we need to push on for our community. So I'm gonna make Marisol tell you a little bit about the Narrative Lab. Um, it's a they helped me in getting better and telling stories. And I want you to hear what she has to say. Wonderful, Katisha. Thank you so much. I am so excited to be here with you today and joining your space. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm, thank you for being um, on. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I, I just love it. And I love sort of being able to see you and talk to you since our since we last saw each other in October, which was so fun. I could talk a little bit about that. But as an intro, my name is Marisol Bayou, and I use she, her, a pronouns, and I'm the executive director of the Housing Narrative Lab. And that Housing Narrative Lab is a national organization. Uh, I live actually in D.C., but I'm originally from the Bronx, yes. but I live in D.C. now. <laughs> um uh, but we are a national organization, and our work is really about helping the public understand who experiences homelessness and housing insecurity uh, and why, right? I mean, you mm -hmm. just so, so perfectly 
summed up so much of the challenge that we have in this country, that people have a perception um, about homelessness just based on like what they see and, and which I get, right? So I'm not, I'm not saying anything about that. And, but what I am saying is that then people, people are basing their perceptions on what they see. And to some extent, it's like that, you know, that famous meme of the iceberg where you have the, the tip of the iceberg is showing, but then right. underneath it, there's just a big giant block of ice. Right. Well, if our perception is only that little t- little tiny bit of ice at the top, we're right. only going to address that little bit of ice at the top. And then there's this whole big giant piece that doesn't get addressed. Right. And so the work of the lab is to help people understand that, yes, there's that piece at the top that you see. And then there's this big giant piece at the bottom and that underneath the water that may not be as readily available, but is, I mean, readily visible, but it's still there. And right. so at the lab, we do, um, the work that we do is we do a lot of research looking at how people think and what shapes their perceptions and how we can talk to them based on the things that they're thinking about. We do a lot of training, which is the, the project that we all worked on together in New York yes. City in October. So that was so fun. Um, and so we get to do a lot of that kind of work where we're just like meeting people who are doing this work on the ground and working with them on how to tell stronger stories. And then the last piece that we do is really provide the the on the ground support, right? Like we are like with people in the trenches and we're like, okay, you know, maybe you think about uh, telling your story, shifting a little bit about this. Or when you go on Twitter, remember that on Twitter, they talk this way versus Instagram where the way you tell the story is going to be a little different. So we do some, we do a lot of hands-on support that way as well. Um, but really the goal of all of it is to help people understand the realities of housing insecurity and homelessness in New York City and across the country. And, and a big way to do that is through storytelling, through stories, through podcasts like yours and the guests that you bring on through people with lived experience, um, having the leadership and that empowerment to tell their stories and make the change that they need to make. For sure. I was definitely thinking about like, you said the iceberg is so true. We address only what we see. Yeah. And that's the problem. I think a lot of times it's like example. Um, I think of what I thought of cancer and I know it's going to be like if something was so dramatic, but if a doctor only took off what they saw on top example, a skin cancer, a little part of it and they didn't dig deeper into the problem that could spread and yeah. we know cancer take out a lot of people's lives and everybody knows somebody who has has cancer there's nobody i could i could think of who don't know not at least one person they know died of cancer who had cancer you know so if we just only clean the surface it's going to spread and spread and spread we don't think about certain different things example if we if we don't think about prevention more people are going to go in shelter more people are going to be homeless. And if we also don't make sure that the services and shelters what people have is not the greatest to give the people enough tools so when they get out of the shelter, they don't have to come back into shelter again, that's going to be a problem. Everything connects with each other and we got to make sure each process is changing and making sure that people know that, yeah, everybody in shelter has not been, you know, came there because they don't have a job or a drug problem. A lot of times that's the what you hear. You hear, oh my gosh, this crackhead or this drug addict, you know, or this person who can't take care. No, people are homeless because of different reasons. And yes, a small percentage of people are going to have that. No matter where you go, it's going to be bad of any percentage of any people, right? But we have to make sure that we have the full picture, the full story. Um, People don't think sometimes about even Katrina, how a lot of families when Katrina happened went homeless. We just think, oh, it's a natural disaster. Yeah, but what after that disaster happened, what happened to the people it actually affected? They went homeless. They didn't have a home to go back to because their home, home was destroyed. So, and that's not their fault. It's a natural occurrence. But we don't think about, oh, yeah, families got hurt in that. Youth got hurt in that. It's, it's, we just don't think about these things. And we yeah. want to make sure that people know that these are people's lives. And things happen. And it can honestly happen, especially in America, it can happen anytime to anybody. A lot of us are living paycheck to paycheck. 
unless you live in uh like a place like I do, like in Nitra, we only take 30% of what you're making and go. Most apartments are not like that. Yeah. You have, you have a set amount and it goes up every couple of years. You have to keep up with that. But your checks are not going up while the rent is going up. So it's like, it's a hard thing. So a lot of people can't fall in this category of just being one or two months behind. And depending on your landlord, if they would like to work with you, you can become this person. You know what I'm saying? A, a lot of things can happen. A fire, I always say all the time, fires can happen. It happens all the time. Yes, yes. You know what I'm 100%. saying? It's the nat not like natural, but it could be um an electric fire. It can be, uh, I guess, a grease fire. You know, different fires happen from different ways. You left a candle out. You didn't think it go hold on to the curtain. All of a sudden, your whole house is on fire because of one thing. You didn't put out a cigarette properly. You be very, Sometimes I know somebody who had faulty wiring in their apartment. They can't. You can't see behind walls to see what's going to happen. So it's like all of a sudden one day. And she, luckily, good for her, is that she wasn't there. So she wasn't stuck inside when the fire was happening. It happened when she was on vacation. But it's also not good for her because her stuff is gone. You know what I'm saying? But I'm happy that she had her life at the end of it. All these different ways is being homeless. A lot of homelessness we don't talk about is also couch surfing. Mm -hmm. People don't think about if you double up with somebody in their home, that's that's not homeless. Yeah, you are homeless. You're not on the lease. Mm -hmm. You're not the dependent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so... That means what you are right now is homeless. It might not be a homeless that certain places count as homelessness because you're yep. not in the system yep. and they have a number, but you're still considered under the umbrella of homelessness. And the only mm -hmm. problem I have with that is that a lot of people who are couch surfing don't get as much services as people who are in the shelter on the street because they're not in the system and people can't find a way to kind of track them. A lot of people yes. don't want to go into shelters for various reasons, especially when you're a single person. Well, in New York City, I could say it's harder in other states, it's much different how they have put families. If you don't know in New York City, unless you're like in a DV things, DV do a different kind of way mm -hmm. how they do it. Mm -hmm. But most, a lot of shelters in New York City who have families, you have your own little compartment in place. In other states, you're not so luxurious to have that. Yep. Other states, some people are sharing. Um, I wish all the states kind of upgraded their system to be like us. Because when you're in a family, mm -hmm. honestly, Congress shelter in general, to be having people that you don't know in your space is kind of weird as it is. But I understand why people, they have it like that. But for families in particular, especially when you have young ones, it can be a lot mm -hmm. um, on a child's psyche and how it is and how they perceive it. And it's, Having a family is stressful already, but having a family plus other families and you don't know them can be a problem. And also sicknesses. You got to think about, example, COVID. Um, mm -hmm. You have a newborn with other stuff. They don't have all the vaccines and they're getting sick from these other families bringing in other diseases. I know the tangent, guys, but you got to think about these things when you think about homelessness but um a hundred a hundred percent you know Khadija a couple of things that I was just gonna add because man you you mentioned so many like great things that really are just some powerful things that really resonated for me one of them was when you talked about double, people who are doubled up and not getting services right because they don't get counted right yeah. so like when the federal government every every county every city does their like yearly counts of people that are experiencing homelessness Right. They're only counting the people they see on the street. Mm -hmm. They're only counting the people that are in shelters and transitional transitional services or safe haven programs. Right. That's it. So if you were, if you're experiencing homelessness and you <clears throat> are couch surfing, if you're going, you know, from your friend's house to your grandma's house to somebody else's house, right. you don't get counted. You're still right. homeless. If you mm -hmm. are in jail and you didn't have a home before you went to jail, you don't get counted either, right? I never thought about that. So, yeah. Yeah. So there's like all these people that are not, that are just not counted as part of, as part of folks that are experiencing homelessness and housing insecurity, right? So right. that was, I think that's a really powerful thing too, because there's a lot of folks that are really looking at how the feds are counting people mm -hmm. because that those counts really are important and they really matter because at the end of the day, that's the count that they then use to say how much funding they're going to provide right. communities right mm -hmm. based on the number of people that they're that they're trying to help and that they're trying to, to provide services for so if you have a whole population populations of right. people that are not counted that's a big deal and guess what this is to also to the kind of crux of your of the work that you do that women with kids women with children and young people, like people be, that are on their own between the ages of 18 and like 24, 25, that may not be on the street, that may be 
sleeping on couches and maybe hiding, right? Mm -hmm. Moms hide because moms don't want to yes. lose their kids. Right? Exactly. They don't get counted. So then the services that they need, there's not going to be enough of it because they're not counted in, as part of the, the group of people that really need, need those services. Um, and so that's like, I think to me, that's like such a critical thing. The other thing too, that you mentioned um, fires and this kind of sparked something for me. So, you know, in, uh, in my previous life, before I was the executive director of the lab and started doing a lot of this kind of advocacy work, I was a journalist and I was a journalist for like 20 something years. And I worked in Philadelphia for a really long time. And most recently, and I, I was I was no longer a reporter in Philly, but I stayed connected to it just because I had lived there for so long. Um, and a few years back, there was this horrible, sad tragedy during the holidays where two sisters were doubled up in an apartment, in a public housing apartment, like, like NYCHA, but the Philly version of it. And they were doubled up and the Christmas tree um, caught oh, fire. No. Always, I'm always scared about that. I'm always scared about the that. Entire apartment oh. and like almost the entire family died. I think like two, two young children. So this was like oh, two moms goodness. and like each of them had two to four kids. And it was this tragedy where they were all living in this apartment, this public housing apartment. And you know, they were all living in this public housing apartment because there's not enough housing. So right. these two families were doubled up. It was like a two bedroom, I think, apartment or two, maybe even a three bedroom apartment. But so it was like 11, 12 people living in this. Place. Right. <laughs> wow. And, and they passed. And it was this tragic, tragic case, yes. right? Yeah. Uh, so to your point about your friends and also like the things that, that families have to do to A, stay together and B, to find some kind of self safe shelter, safe place mm -hmm. to be. And even in their case, it turned out to, you know, the wiring, who knows, right? Know. I mean, all the things. That's so <laughs> sad. I want to tell so anybody who's listening, I know this is a horror heard all over the world, right? But for people who live in New York, if you do go to PATH, which is where the families are with children under 21, because it changed, I want to say last year, a couple years ago, but it used to be under 18, now it's 21. If you go there and they don't want to put you in the shelter because they don't like to put, they like to deny a lot of people. And they said, if you have a person that you want to live with. So this is mostly for people who are doubled up. If you want people to help you pay your rent towards that person, so they'll pay rent and you're going to pay people a little bit more you can. Um, they go to them and they'll help you pay your friend's rent. So you don't feel like, you know, like when you live with somebody, you feel like to me, I feel like a burden. So at least if I got help from somebody to pay them, you feel less as a burden because you're paying them, you know? Okay. And also they want a little bit more. They, you know, you can give a little more money if you can afford it to them. At least they know that, you know, you're paying your part. You're not just using their water, um, maybe eating their food if you don't have a job, depending on your situation, things like that. So um, just be mindful of those things also. And yes. So we want to make sure that, like what Marisol does, is we want to make sure people know how things actually look. And I want Marisol to kind of talk about how we should, we use the word asset framing. So when people, if you're listening to this, it could be another journalist or somebody who just came across this and say, this is like, it seems like an interesting topic to think about and talk about. So how we should kind of talk about stories and how we should put it out there and what kind of way we should get away from talking about it. Because people talk about stories for years, but what is the right way you think we should be talking about certain topics to make sure we get our point across, but also don't make, it looked as bad as it as it is. Does that make sense? I feel like that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, no, that makes yes, that makes that makes a lot of sense. And I hear all the pieces of what you're saying. So the first thing I will say is that stories are so important, Khadija, because stories are how we as people communicate. It's the it's just naturally how how we build trust with each other, how we learn about each other. We tell stories, right? I mean, right. I I told you I live in DC, but I'm originally from the Bronx. Right there, that tells you, and I tell everybody that, not just because right. I'm on a podcast. <laughs> That's true. She does say that. <laughs> people in Oregon, and I'm like, I'm from the Bronx, right? <laughs> um, so, so I wear my boogie down, very proud. And so, but that says a lot, right? Those are things that that really kind of um, help us understand each other is stories. So that's the first thing, which I, I think are powerful. And it's the reason why it's so important for people with lived experience 
to tell their stories and for them to, for people with lived experience to feel comfortable and empowered to tell your story, right? Because because the other thing is that you don't want the organization to be like, you have to say so, you got to talk to journalists. That's very transactional and that's going to freak people out. They're like, I don't know, I'm embarrassed, <laughs> this is hard, I'm in trauma, like all the things. So so part of that, when we're, when we're working with and talking with people, especially people with lived experience, is like folks have to kind of get to a place where they have worked with their trauma and that maybe telling in some cases telling your story and owning your story and the part of the story you want to tell that owning that provides you the leadership that you have and that you need to to be to be empowered to tell your story so so i want to like start off a little bit just sort of big picture talking about story and then the other piece that we that you mentioned asset framing which i just think is so important asset framing is um, there's this, there's a famous communicator who kind of came up with this concept asset framing. His name is Trabian Shorters for anybody who wants to look him up. Uh, his last name is Shorters, S-H-O-R-T-E, uh, S-H-O-R-T-E-R-S. And his first name is Trabian, T-R-A-B-I-A-N. And he's awesome. And he came up with this phrasing about asset framing. And he says, state their best before the rest, mm -hmm. which is, I don't have to start my story out telling you about my childhood trauma of homelessness. I don't have to start my story telling you about like the the all the the hard pieces. I don't have to tell you all of my business right away, right? right? But I can tell you when I was a kid, I loved to read. I loved to read and I wanted to write the books that I could read, but you know, there was no place for me to have a whole bunch of books. I couldn't move around with them, right? In the beginning with, with too many books. And right. so, but so part of the, right? Part of that state the rest before the rest is, uh, or state to their best before the rest is really about like starting with like, what's your aspiration? What is your goal? What is my contribution to society, to New York, to my community? Right. What is the thing that I that I am before? Right. The what, whatever all the other pieces come. So a really good example. I'm going to give you an example of a, of a documentary called Lift. And Lift is about young people in the Bronx. Sorry. Sorry, mom. I just <laughs> the Bronx for a minute. Right. But it's young people in New York City. Many of them live in the Bronx uh, who are are aspiring ballet dancers. Right. And these are oh, young yeah. black and brown children who are like beautiful movements and artists. And this whole thing, you're like the dancers, they want to be ballet dancers. And then it's not for like a hot second after we are all in with them wanting to get their dream of dancing ballet in front of all the stages that you find out that they actually are also children who are experiencing homelessness and they have varying degrees of living in shelters and living in crowded apartments and all of those things. But right. that story didn't right. start out telling you about that trauma. This right. story started out with these children who are like nine and 10 years old on their little pointed toes doing their, I don't know anything about ballet, right? But you know, they're like doing their pirouettes and they're practicing and all the things that it takes to be a dancer. Right. And you start like rooting for them. And right. then you find out, right? Come to find out that, that that they have more challenges than other people because they don't have a safe, stable place to to do the dancing that they want to do. And the documentary is actually all about a young man who is an amazing dancer and has danced all over the world as a ballet dancer and also started his life homeless as well with his family. And now he's come back to train all these young dancers who are also experiencing homelessness. And that's a perfect example of like, nobody's telling you the challenge, nobody's skipping over the challenges that these young people are facing. Because, you know, when we're telling stories, we are telling stories that are authentic, that are true to us, right? right. And so, so that's so important, but you could see it's not what we're saying, but how. 
right? It's yeah. the how got you embedded in rooting for these dancers. And then you're realizing, oh my goodness, they are facing some deep challenges to become the the artists that they want to become uh, and the dancers that they that they want to become versus the other way around where you're like, oh, what was these poor little kids, right? <laughs> right. Like that's, it's different. One is about like, like having empathy and understanding and having a dream that you aspire to and then being able to figure out how am I overcoming the challenges I'm facing versus the other one is like, oh, I feel sorry for these kids, right? And the two very different, one is empowering and one is not so empowering, right? What I love about it, I didn't get to um see it. I was supposed to see it, and I never it just didn't happen. Um, at the NIAH thing, which is um yes! the National Alliance to End Homelessness last year, they showed it last year. I was I was I was more talking than getting to watch the movie, but I ate the popcorn. Like a lot of you, but um, what I like about stories like that is that people I think think of people who are homeless who are even before used to be homeless is that. They think only about homelessness. Like that's their whole life is just like once you're homeless, your whole life is being homeless, even when you're not homeless anymore. But the truth is, is that homelessness is not your whole life. Unless you stay there 30, 40 years, maybe that's a good part of your life. But a person like myself, average family in New York City, stays in um shelter for over a year and a half, a year and change, right? Um, some people do go back, so that's gonna be a second part of their life. It's only a part of their story. Homelessness is not the whole ideal. You you're born, you're homeless, you die. That's not what it is, right? It's That's not the small, aspiration. Right. <laughs> it's a small, minute part of your life. So to tell people about where you have been, the good stuff in your life, to make you own, make you be a human. People think that people who are homeless are not human in a way. We're human just like everybody else. We have other things that make us who we are. And if you know what created us into this person, and then we tell you how we got here. And hopefully, by the time I finish with your story, you are in a better place than you started out in the beginning. That's why I always want to hear like stories about people, not only in the shelter, like, yes, that's great. But where are you now? Where where are you planning to go? What's your next five years potential of what you see in your mind? Where do you can plan all you want and stuff still happen? Um, but it's just nice to know that you have an idea and have goals for the future. You know what I'm saying? Um, homelessness is just not a whole idea of ourselves. It's just a part of a small story. And what I like about it also is that, as you said, it's inspired people. And I want to inspire people to be able to stand up and be a voice for other people. Because not everybody's going to be a person like me who's going to be on a podcast or a person like me who goes to a rally and talk, but speak up for policies. Everybody doesn't have the energy for that. They have other things to think about. This is not their full-time job. Like, it's mine. Also, they just don't, a lot of people don't like to be in the limelight. They like to be the behind the scenes and not be the face of anything. But I want to be able to inspire people to be able to advocate for themselves while they're in the situation and also be an advocate for other people when they get out of situations. I think that's why I was meant to be homeless. Well, it happened, right? Um, but I think I'm able to help people who are homeless now to get out of it and also advocate for themselves while they're in shelter. Because in shelter, if you sometimes if you're just complacent, you're not doing anything, you're not going to get out of it. But she, depending on what shelter you are, some shelters, are, as you know, are better than others, right? But some people are not, they're just not doing their job correctly. And you need to get them a boost by the advocating for yourself, talking about what I need, what I think should be happening. What's my next step? You might think that's saying what's our next step is not the a big thing. right? That's yes. the empowerment piece. Mm -hmm. You have to. So um, I hope these these recordings are able to help you just not hear people's stories, but to also use the resources that we give you and know what's out there. Because sometimes shelters, not all shelters are equipped with the same information. So if I give you something, take that and run with it for yourself. And also if you know somebody who needs the help, take that information to also give it to somebody else. So I hope that helps people with on the podcast in general um, with knowing who who is homeless and what we look like and know that we are regular people, Joe Schmoes like everybody else, and that we are coming out on the other side as a better person. And yeah, whatever makes, whatever took you down for a minute will make you stronger in the future. I promise you, every bad incident can make you be a better person. Because before I was homeless, you know, I was like, mm. You, you, you think you know what homelessness is until you actually actually been homeless. Because I thought, mm -hmm. you know, you know, yeah. I didn't even think about homelessness, I mean, as in a shelter before I went homeless. I only honestly thought about people in the street. That's what that's what you see, especially in New York City. You mm -hmm. see them on the street, they're lying down. You don't think about shelter as much. And um, going into, actually having the process in my life, I, it was much different. Um, a lot of things you realize about yourself. And then I got more help for depression after I got out of shelter because I was actually depressed a lot and I didn't realize it. So a lot of things you learn and get trauma. from being that. Yes. 
So thank you for coming for this week's of Hear Our Voices. We are going to come next week with part two for Narrative Lab. I hope you're able to learn information that you never learned before. I hope it gave you an insight to people who are formerly homeless and how we are trying to make solutions and just not show people and highlight a problem, you know. Um, we want to be a solution-based podcast where you list the stories, hear about resources, and also change the narrative of people who are homeless. Thank you and talk to you next time.